Welcome to this episode of our show, True Data Ops. I'm your host, Kent Graziano, the Data Warrior. In each episode, we're going to bring you a podcast covering all things related to data ops and the people that are making data ops what it is today. If you've not yet done so, please be sure to look up and subscribe to the dataops.live YouTube channel. That's where you're going to find all the recordings from our past episodes. So if you missed any of our prior episodes, you can catch up there. Better yet, go to truedataops.org and subscribe to this podcast. Then you'll be sure not to miss any of the future episodes. Now, my guest today is industry analyst, advisor, consultant, and the founder and CEO of Bark, Dr. Karsten Bonger. I almost said it right. I got close. <laughs> Welcome, Karsten. <laughs> Kent, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So for the, the folks who don't know you, uh, can you give us a little bit about your background in data management and what you all do over there at Bark? Absolutely. Yeah, I founded Bark 25 years ago, so quite a while in the industry. I founded it as an industry analyst, meaning that we look at all the vendors in our space, but we are uh, specialized on the data analytics space. So we are not an analyst trying to cover all software segments or even more, but we only do data and analytics. And um, being an advisor to clients or users, we help them to make the right decisions, meaning on data strategy, on architectural choices, but also especially on technology selection, since that's our core area we look at. Hey, so what, what does B-A-R-C stand for? I assume it stands for something and maybe maybe in German? <laughs> no, it's in English. It's a business application research center. And it oh. alludes to our uh, roots, basically. We started this as an as a project uh, at a university, at a chair for information science. We created a test lab for business intelligence software. This is now back in 1998. Wow. And so we were comparing all the great solutions that were out there at that time. So I'm talking about uh, Arbor Space. I'm talking about Cognos, uh, PowerPlay, and Holos, and all the good stuff. <laughs> and wow. uh, so we are creating this test lab. And basically, the idea was to try to help enterprises make an informed decision on software. And um, this went very well. So people, we, we published this first in books and then later as studies. And then companies came and said, well, this is great. This really helps us in this intransparent marketplace to get an idea what the software is really useful for, where the strengths and weaknesses are. And you being at university, you are truly independent and neutral yeah, and can really help us. And you have no interest in selling our software as most other people that tell us about software. Mm -hmm. And this is what we definitely maintained. Yeah? So we maintained this independence from the, the software vendors and also from the interest of uh, selling a, a big consulting project to implement it. So that's what we are not doing. But we focus on this evaluation of technology and helping our clients to make the right decisions here. And, and you, you have a very interesting event that you do every year, right? Yeah, you you are talking about the retreat where you also participated once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an, an industry event. Um, we actually we run the largest events for or on data and analytics in the German speaking countries. That's our core market for events. And the one you are talking about is a very specific one. That's a, a, like a vendor workshop. So we are um, bringing together analysts from all over the world and uh, vendors on the other side that we brief on uh, trends. We are seeing changes in buying behavior on the user side. We bring in investors that talk about their view on the market and we have a big discussion or great discussion going. Yeah, what, what trends do we observe and how does the industry react? in terms of how do users and buyers of software react to changes and how do the vendors react or should react to that. That makes it very unique, I think, um, as a gathering of vendor executives. 
Um, and and with that, we it's it's always astonishing what a brain pool in a way we have in the room. Yeah, many uh, of the attendees with 20, 30, maybe even more years of experience in our industry. So that always makes a, a very good discussion and a great strategy workshop, if you want to call it. That. Yeah, and that's great. So that's really kind of how Bart stays up with the trends and what's happening and knowing knowing what vendors are thinking about and where they're going to go in the space so that you can advise, you know, basically everybody, the rest of us <laughs> as to what's going on out there. You probably have a better insight than a lot of people do because you're getting that uh, kind of cross section of the industry by having vendors and analysts and investors all together. Yeah, exactly. So we are following um, around 400 vendors in the space around let's say 100 to 150 more closely in a way that we get briefed by them uh, or we have a frequent interaction with them so that's, that's like the larger vendors in our space and then we have another like 300 250 that we at least we know what they are doing and we have a, an idea yeah where they where they're positioned in the market so that's quite a lot to cover but I think what's really uh, good for us is to have also this uh, end user exposure. So really working with them on their requirements, understanding them, yeah, what use cases do they actually try to solve? Also getting their feedback uh, from proof of concepts from the actual implementation. So what works with the software versus not, where were they disappointed? What looked good on PowerPoint? <laughs> what didn't work in practice and so on? Yeah, well, along those lines, you know, data products is one of those hot industry buzzwords that's been going around at, um, you know, every, probably every conference, you know, every other blog post that's out there, every other podcast is talking about it, including ours. Um, so what's your take on that concept and, you know, what it means and, you know, how does it really fit in the, in our, I'll say modern data landscape that we're dealing with for analytics? Yeah, I think you can take different views on that. Uh, first of all, I think we see that it became quite popular with the data mesh concept. And that's an, we, we define data mesh as an organizational concept and data fabric would be more a term that's often used in, in, uh, in, in relation to that, but we would say this is more the technical right. implementation. Yeah. So, so data mesh as an organizational concept also calls for data products that are developed in a decentral fashion yeah, in the domains. And we see that this made this whole idea of data products quite popular, but it has been around before. So we were talking about data products and um, the good ideas behind this concept already before the data mesh concept was out. So I think... Um, it's, it's basically the question and the idea, how can we make data more accessible across the organization? That's one thing. The second thing is that, is that we see uh, many uh, problems um, with running data and analytics projects yeah? or trying to get something done, let's put it that way, in data and analytics. If you have a project-oriented approach, yeah, we all know about the, the deficiencies here, the problems, yeah, and one, for example, is that it has an end, <laughs> which basically that's yeah, not right. I mean, we are in the data, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we are in a data ops podcast. So if you want to operationalize something, obviously you cannot have an end, but you have to have an ongoing process, and that's not only true for data pipelines, but that's basically true for everything. Yeah, even if you build a dashboard from day one you will have changes you will have new requirements you have people asking for different things and um so that's the one of the biggest problems the second um idea in data products that we see that resonates very well is this idea of end-to-end -end responsibility yeah so if we do it right we end this endless discussion on whose fault it was that something's going wrong yeah is it the requirements is it the it implementation yeah so people are, are arguing who, who who made the mistake and are ignoring that basically in my belief is in data and analytics um, we will never find uh, a user that can actually express what they really want yeah so and plus any requirement will change extremely quick, um, quickly. So um, that these two things together will lead to a, to an approach, or we have to have an approach that, that is always incorporating iteration, 
changes and that quickly. So it needs to be agile. Right. I was just going to say, you're, 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 talking, you're talking my language here on, on agile because you know, I got into doing agile data warehousing back in the early 2000s when people weren't even talking about that. And the, the concept of having a product owner and a prioritized backlog and all of those sorts of things really um, allowed my teams to be more successful, right? As we thought about it that way, like you said, there was end to end that that product owner was from the business and they bore as much responsibility on the outcome and the quality of the outcome as we did as the IT team that was, you know, building the ETL and the data warehouses and all of that sort of thing, that it really became, you know, that team effort. It was much more of a team effort. And I think that the data products concepts as they're being discussed now today, more so thanks again, like you said, to data mesh, uh, having that product mindset is, is very, is very different. You know, you think about Ford, right? They, they don't just, build one car and that's it. And they do the same thing forever. It's obviously evolved and changed over time. And, you know, cars break down and have to be repaired and they have to say, is there a better way we could engineer that? So it doesn't have to be repaired all the time. And in the agile world, we, we call that technical debt and refactoring. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, right. I, I, I agree yeah. with you. I think this is uh, it, it's not completely new but it's gotten, I'll say, new life and maybe some new focus as a result of all these recent discussions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's some discussion around what actually a data product is, some definitions. We prefer a broader one. Yeah? So we think also, for example, data uh, or dashboards yeah, or applications that are data or analytics rich. Yeah, We would also say that's a data product, but I mean, in the end, it doesn't matter. It, the, the, it has to uh, help us to bring uh, data to life, yeah? to bring, make it easier to share it across an organization and all the good ideas in data products like, um, uh, like ownership, like also modular, modularization, I think is super important. And all these things um, really bring us forward and help us overcome problems that we have with a more traditional project-oriented yeah. approach. So, um... Yeah, you mentioned data ops. Like you said, obviously, this is a data ops podcast. So what, what's your perspective on data ops processes and, and how this you know really fits into all of this? Data products or not? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, no matter how you call it. But um, what we see also in our research, um, we talked about our... Um, our approach to help clients directly in a more advisory consulting fashion. But our biggest um, area of our business is actually the research side. So we do a lot of empirical research, so primary research in our market to understand better what's going on. And um, what, what we see consistently over years now is that the um, one of the biggest problems that the professionals have or the practitioners have is the actual oper operationalization, very difficult word, of um, anything they do. Yeah? And so getting to a, a pilot or before that, getting to a proof of concept um, is typically not so hard. But taking the last mile, the last step of bringing it really to life um, in an operational context into the processes, that's the really hard thing. And um, this is consistent over the years. Yeah. And we see that data ops next to any other ops, especially um, ML ops, that mm -hmm. has been a top of mind for, for some years now with the rise of, of more uh, AI or data science uh, related um, projects or products, um, has really uh, helped uh, to focus on the, the processes and task at hand that you need to do to operationalize. Yeah, to make that successful. And it starts, I think, with a mindset yeah, that you understand, mm -hmm. ah, okay, there is something to be done. There is a problem that we need to solve. And secondly, obviously, um, I mean, you, you have your, your approach there, yeah, how to do it, what steps to take, what to take care of. But I think the key thing is here is that operationalization is a big challenge. And we need to really have a, a very close look at it, how we can solve it how we can overcome it in projects. Yeah, so uh, how do you see the role of automation, you know, maybe even AI-driven automation for, for data ops and the importance of it? 
Well, I mean, automation is key. No, we we have to automate because we see uh, obviously also on a general term we see data volumes rising. We see the um, the frequency of data integration um, let's say decreasing in terms of yeah it's going down to real time yeah instead of having seconds minutes days to integrate data. We see often complexity rising in terms of what, for example, needs to be calculated along the way, what needs to be done. We see um, an increasing amount of external data to be integrated into data landscape, which typically also increases things like you have to have more quality checks, for example. Yeah, you don't you don't have control over the schema anymore. Yeah. So things that are adding to complexity. So all this leads to a an, an higher um, challenge in a way. And this is where automation comes into play because trying to see will simply not work. Yeah, and one of our key pillars in the uh, seven pillars of true data ops is um, automated testing and, and monitoring. And I think that's you know what you were just alluding to there, yeah, with especially if you don't have control of the data, you're getting third party data. How do you make sure that Again, it's we're we're still dealing with and will forever will deal with garbage in, garbage out. You know, making sure that we're getting the right kind of data, the right quality of data, and not having things break in our operational pipelines. Yeah, exactly. So quality is an, an <laughs> a constant concern, and basically it will ever be. I completely agree, and. Um, we we always I mean we I said we do a lot of these empirical research and and data quality always comes top if you ask about challenges yeah wherever in in machine learning in BI in data management it doesn't matter um, so we we always ask the question but when do we when do we actually solve this challenge yeah <laughs> but the good news is I do see more initiatives uh, in data governance. Yeah, I do see companies taking a bit more care about it and thinking about it and also taking action, meaning actually allocating resources, actually being more serious about tackling this problem. So I have a, a little bit of hope <laughs> that this will get better um, and that more and more companies understand that if they really think that data is an asset and that it really contributes to their business strategy uh, that uh, or positively um, influences their business strategy, then that they also have to take care uh, about this asset. Uh, so if we see more and more companies being serious about that, then I have a bit of hope that we also um, finally tackle this data quality topic. Yeah. Um... So what do you think is driving companies to actually be thinking about this more, the governance and quality aspects of uh, data management? I think it's um, the strategic importance of data analytics has increased, I think, significantly. Um, it used to be more an afterthought, yeah? some data that comes out of our main systems, the ERP systems or others, and that needs to be reported. But if it's not working properly, it's it's not a not a big problem. Yeah, Our core processes are still running. That used to be the case. Now it's different. Yeah? We see more yeah. and more processes that rely on data that cannot work any way uh, without data. So I think the strategic importance is higher. Uh, I think it's also a maturity topic that we have more and more companies being more mature about how to to handle data, how to think about data, and that they now um, really see as a current example, yeah, Gen AI got all this hype. And what happened? Yeah, no wonder after like six or 12 months, uh, people or companies started to realize, oh, it's again the same topic yeah if, if whatever we feed these models is garbage yeah then we will have no yep. good results and so i think it's again a little bit adding to the maturity here that we need to take care of the data first yeah and i think there's a little bit of urgency too because people are wanting to jump on the uh, gen ai bandwagon and like you said they realize like well you have to feed that whether you know we were we've been talking about machine learning and AI for a number of years now, and that's still been the same thing. You have to train the model, and what are you training the model with? You know, where is that data coming from that you're training the model with, and what's the quality of that data um, is is very important if you're you know trying to develop one of these things and you want the results to be useful and accurate. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
So um, in your, you have a podcast called uh, a data culture, the data culture podcast. And in that podcast, you say data culture eats data strategy for breakfast. So could you explain a little bit of what that means and, you know, the importance of having a strong data culture for success? Uh, and, you know, what, what is a strong data culture from your perspective? What does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the quote you just uh, used is obviously uh, taken from a pretty famous quote in management literature yeah, that says um, culture eats strategy for breakfast, meaning any type of, of strategy you want to or business strategy you want to implement in your organization. If the culture of an organization is not um, supporting it, uh, then it will fail. And I think the same is true for data. So if you if you have a data strategy, but your data culture in an organization is not supporting it then again yeah it will be to no avail you you have great thoughts uh, what you could achieve but in the end you will um you will not be able to achieve it yeah. so what is data culture it's the things that you cannot really uh, see and and uh, define clearly so typically we say it's it's the values the beliefs the behaviors yeah, within an organization that promote the effective and ethical use of data. So that's data culture. And it's it's part of the company culture. So whatever you, you know and see and feel about a company culture is typically also reflecting on a data culture. Yeah, so it's I, I always compare it in a way, if you walk or if you're a new employee in an organization, you get a lot of things in a structured and formal way, like an employee handbook and in a process description and so on. But then there's also this informal thing. That's the culture of the organization. Yeah. And you feel that very quickly. It takes maybe a few days or weeks, and then you understand what type of organization it is. Is it very hierarchical or not? Yeah. What type of how are decisions being made? How are people treating each other? How are people treating their customers? And often that's not really written down, but it's really more a set of, of values, of beliefs, of how things are being done. Yeah, so, And why do I think it's important? Because we see that these more people-related aspects of how data is being used are equally important to any strategy you have in terms of, yeah, you, you think about use cases and how you support the business strategy, you think about technology, what you want to use, and so on and so on. But if you forget about the people that in the end actually would have to use the technology, make it work, um, use the results of any type of data processing that we do, then you will fail. That's the, the, the hard statement here. That's why data culture is so important and to be really focusing on that as a major success factor next to your business-related data strategy, your technology-related uh, data strategy. That's uh, the statement here. And that's why I caught my podcast, Data Culture Podcast, because we, I, or we, in terms of also now close to 100 guests, think that it's super important. And we want to help people that um, want to address the topic, how they can actually do that. Yeah, I like the fact that you your part of your definition of data culture is effective and ethical use of data. Um, that's definitely become a the ethic ethics of data usage has certainly become a much hotter topic with the advent of AI and Gen AI Gen AI in particular. I was at the the Data Universe conference in uh, in New York last week, and they actually had one stage that it was that was kind of dedicated to talks about ethical use of data and, and putting ethics policies together and things like that. And it's a, it's a very important conversation that it, in many ways has been, I think, inferred in organizations in the past, but not necessarily directly discussed other than in terms of compliance with things like GDPR and CCPA. And, but that's more of a, that's a regulatory compliance discussion. It's not really an ethics discussion. And you know, I think the conversation is, is changing a little bit now, thankfully. Yeah, absolutely. I, I see the same. It has started maybe five years ago with the advent of AI that came top of mind with all the data scientist discussions and so on. So more companies were investing in more AI. 
And uh, here very quickly, we had these discussions and also these prominent examples of bias and data and then what, what could come out of it and uh, or what bad results basically could come out of it. And we had the firm, we, we run an event called the Data Festival in Munich each year. And we had this like five years ago already, uh, first companies going on stage and saying, well, okay, we need to have a guideline for our data scientists, how to treat data yeah, and how to uh, make sure that the outcome, for example, the models they are building are actually um, working uh, ethically correct yeah so i think that was the first time this was really starting and now it's definitely accelerating with uh, especially with the european union ai act that is now becoming real and now we see that in many organizations um, they start to really look at it because they understand something's coming yeah there's a, re a regulatory pressure coming and so they need to take care of it. Yeah, so I think that even accelerated this uh, discussion and the process here. Yeah. So our, you know, uh, I'll say our traditional data management practices of governance and privacy are kind of expanding, right? And so now we're now we're having to include things like ethical use of the data. I mean, to me, that's that's a governance question, right? Is how how are we using the data? What kind of data are we producing? Mm -hmm. um, and you know is that in line with what i guess as an organization we believe is ethical according to our organizational values exactly yeah which it's, means you got to have a data culture defined right otherwise you don't know what those are you can't answer those questions exactly yeah so that's where things come together ah yeah oh good very good well um let's see we're, we're kind of coming up on our time now um what are you looking forward to for the rest of 2024? In well, the um, in the data world. In the um, data world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, there are many things happening um, that will have an effect. Right now, the discussion is still a bit overlaid by Gen AI, I think that dominate a lot of discussions. But what I think is positive is that it gets now more down to earth in terms of the question, uh, yeah, what can we actually do? And we do see a big gap in what is possible and what potentially could be done and what is actually being done in organizations, in companies. Yeah, So there's a, a very big adoption gap uh, and that's, I think, this year will be the year where things have to happen. Yeah? So where um, anyone involved in Gen AI in whatever uh, fashion will have to deliver. Yeah? And that, I think, it will be super interesting because, as usual, there are a lot of promises, but there will also be a lot of tears of things that will not deliver the results that people thought they would. <laughs> and so... I think this will be super interesting to observe this year. Second thing is, as we all know, in data and analytics, um, there are many things that Gen AI will not solve. Yeah, where well, will not uh, actually advance things. If you think about calculations, yeah, and and the, let's say the core analytics. But I'm super interested to see what happens in terms of an innovation side. Yeah, so I mean, there are already announcements like from or I read about OpenAI saying, well, the GPT-5 will have major improvements, for example, in analyzing data yeah, on or capabilities to analyze data. So uh, I'm super interested to see what will happen there. Um, and then, I mean, we have advances in, in on all levels. Um, I think the um, increased... Um, um, the increased automation on the one side and increased user friendliness yeah, in using uh, any type, data management solutions, BI, dashboarding, reporting, whatever. Um, I think how this plays out is one of the most interesting things. Yeah? So how now software vendors adapt these new capabilities. And again, most of what we have seen so far is slideware. <laughs> so vendors announcing <laughs> what they <laughs> want to do. And um, most of them promise to deliver something this year. 24, I think, will be the year where we see how Gen AI uh, for data and analytics will actually um, be uh, visible in products, in actual products. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense because I think the the popularity of Gen AI and even things just like Chat GPT is driving that question of why can't my analytics platform be this easy to use, right? Yeah. And so we're really again, hopefully taking another big leap forward in our attempts to, as we've been saying for several decades, democratize data, democratize analytics. Uh, have You don't have to be a highly technical individual in order to get value out of the data that we can have, you know, business people who are running the business get use from that data without having to call somebody in IT to, to make something happen. Exactly. And that's, that's what, it's very actually, exciting. Yeah, yeah, it is. And that, by the way, that will also drive data culture. Yeah? Because if it's easier, yep. yeah, then you have, you have an, an easier probability to actually have it spread out in the organization. Yeah, and there'll be more adoption. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, great. So uh, what's next on the list for you? Do you have any conferences or meetups or anything coming up uh, in the next couple of months before you hit uh, uh, summer vacation period there in Europe? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we um, first of all, what's really top of mind for us is our U.S. expansion. We are investing a lot um, in the U.S. We have now uh, three people on the ground and it's, the team is growing. And that's super exciting for us because our ambition is to be the leading global uh, analyst company specialized on data and analytics. And that's a major step forward to do that. Yeah, we, we had one of your colleagues on here a couple of months ago. I know, Sean, Sean, Sean was with you. Yeah. That's great. And um, so that that's definitely a big thing for us. Then uh, in a few weeks and four weeks time, we run the biggest trade show for data analytics in the German speaking countries. That's the big data and AI world in Frankfurt. So that's definitely keeping us quite busy. And then we have some uh, events focused on finance. Uh, and the next one that has a global impact will be the data festival online. We do it once in Munich and one uh, in online that will be in November. So a bit of time, but um, that has, has a pretty big global audience. Awesome. So uh, what's the best way for folks to connect with you if they want to follow up on this and follow what you're doing and see the announcements for all these events. Yeah, follow me on LinkedIn. That's, I think, the best source to see what's going on. And obviously, we also have uh, bark.com as a web page where you can mm -hmm. see what research is available and what we are doing. Okay, so that's barc.com, right? Exactly. And then there's your LinkedIn QR code for folks. That's the, your quickest way to, to link up with Karsten. Make sure when you send him a mess, connect message that you tell him you saw him here on the True Data Ops podcast so he'll know how you found him. Well, thank thank you so much for being my guest today, Karsten. Um, it was a great talk. Uh, thanks for everybody online for, for joining us and hope you got some value out of this conversation. Uh, be sure to join me again in two weeks when I'm going to be live from Stowe, Vermont at the Worldwide Data Vault Conference. I'll be talking with Cohen Verhain and Sean Johnson from Vault Speed. Uh, they happen to be one of our data ops live automation partners. So we were talking about automation earlier. So I'm going to talk to a couple of folks about that in two weeks. Now, note that this is actually a live event. Uh, as in in person, I mean, all our events are generally live, but I'm going to actually be in the same room with these guys. Uh, I did this last year, so it'll be the second in person, I guess I should say in person rather than live, in person interview with the, the folks from Vault Speed up there in Vermont. But because it's live, we had to make a couple of adjustments because uh, we're right in the middle of a conference there. And so we're going to be one hour earlier than normal. So make sure you make a note of that on your calendar. It'll be one hour earlier. Um, when we do that event, but the announcements will be coming out here on face, um, Facebook. Yeah. On LinkedIn. And you can, uh, obviously register that way and you'll get the notifications. So as always be sure to like, and like the replays from today's show, uh, tell your friends about the true data ops podcast, and don't forget to go to truedataops.org, subscribe to the podcast to make sure that you don't miss any future episodes. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, until next time, this is Kent Graziano, the Data Warrior, signing off for now.